Welcome to Tech Trends. Tech Trends is a podcast series that provides perspective on the latest trends in technology, fintech, and digital. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the design and development of mobile applications and how businesses can take similar approaches to really take advantage of this increasingly important client channel. I'm Anish Bamani, Chief Information Officer for Commercial Banking, and joining me today is Rob Wyant, Lead Mobile Application Developer for Consumer and Community Banking at J.P. Morgan Chase. Rob, welcome to Tech Trends. Hi, Anish. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So, Rob, it feels like we're constantly hearing about the latest new app, right? And everybody's got hundreds of apps on their phone and things like that. I think at last count, there were over 2 million apps available for download on the various stores. Can you talk a little bit about what makes a good idea and what makes a good mobile app? Absolutely. Well, it's tough to predict what's going to make a great mobile app, but there are certainly tips that will help increase your odds for success. I found my way to Chase after working as a lead developer for a few startups. I co-founded a startup. I essentially lived in WeWorks uh, and participated in hackathons. So I really understand the grind that it takes to build something great. To address your question, the first thing that I'm looking for is, are you solving a real problem? And that sounds really basic in theory, but it's often something that gets lost. You have this grand idea of building out something really cool with technology, but if there's no underlying problem that you're solving, then it's going to be really hard to position it in the market, and it'll be really expensive to acquire users and get traction. So the absolute best thing that you can do is solve for a problem that you're experiencing yourself. To drive this point home, just look at the Apple, the suite of Apple apps. You have the calculator, you have the calendar, notes, stopwatch. There's no denying that those apps are solving for a specific problem. And then look at Spotify or Netflix. They're essentially verbs because they solve specific problems and do a great job of their core competency. Netflix isn't trying to sell you ads. It's not heavy on product placement. They know their core competency is producing great content and they do that extremely well. And so make sure you have a clearly defined problem that you're solving for and have that be your North Star. So that's great advice. Um, I think that's advice though that can apply to almost anything. What makes, a, what makes a new product relevant to market or anything else like that. When you think about building mobile apps versus a desktop app or a website or anything else like that, how do you think about what makes a good candidate for that? I, I go back to the early days of, uh, of the iPhone or Android and everybody was racing to take their web apps and put them on mobile. And a lot of those died because they didn't really have a compelling mobile experience, right? So how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, you really need to figure out what your feature set's gonna be. Um, a lot of what startups are gonna do or what the MVP is gonna do will be great as a website or a hybrid app. But as you start to expand and, and really pay attention to how the customers are using it, there's tools that the native experience that will give you out of the box that will take it to the next level. So um, something as simple as push notifications to drive more traffic, to drive uh, you know, some kind of um, workflow. That um, is a really great, um, way to get customers to come back. Um, corporate apps, I found, are being influenced by customer trends. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, you can go down to Amazon and in one click, you can buy anything and get it shipped to you. Well, we're a banking app, so we need to adjust our user experiences and our flows to try to be as close to that, because that's what the customers are really expecting. And a great example in the Chase mobile app is the fact that with a click of a button, you can deposit a check. And mm -hmm. so if you think about it years ago, you had to, you know, sign the back of the check, go to an ATM, walk into a bank branch to, in order to get that money to be uh, funded into your account. Um, once I showed that one feature to my grandma, as I, as I started working at Chase, she, she really got what my job was. I wasn't just <laughs> someone that tinkered around on iPhones. I could actually deliver a service for, for a good deal of people that, that was helpful. Yeah, I always, I always running Joey, everybody's grandma. Like, oh, do you fix the typewriters at work when they break? Is that what you do? Right. So yeah, yeah. So, but but that's a great point. Is take advantage of the native capabilities, whether it be you know the GPS or the camera or you know the microphone. You can do a lot with that that you can't do you know with a traditional web experience, right? So so you lead a mobile development team at Chase. Can you walk us through the process of how you think about new features and create new features from mockups to wireframes to the actual development of the app? Yeah, so going from mockups to actually production ready features, um, oftentimes we're impacted, we're impacting a bunch of different stakeholders. Um, we're, as developers, I'm working really closely with the designers and the product team. Um, and, and we usually start the process by 
coming together and finding synergies around a problem. And then the designers will put together a prototype, often black and white, um, that will um, wire out what it would look like. And we'll spend some time iterating on that. Um, the most fun part for me is taking those prototypes and actually um, getting customer feedback in the form of uh, in the form of research and focus groups. You can learn a lot from those sessions. Mm -hmm. We actually have a room in our office at Chase that has double paned windows that will take these clickable prototypes to. And so we can ask que questions to real customers about what they would expect to see. And then my team can be on the other side of that window and watch and learn from their interactions. This helps us not only figure out what the best UI would be, you know, where to place the buttons and, and, and the text on the screen, but also what the best user experience could be, uh, you know, how to walk through the feature and what they would expect the feature to do for them. And so after that, the, the designers and the product teams usually learn from, from those insights and then they'll put together a fully spec'd out um, a screen that will be delivered to the development team to define requirements into code. The whole process takes a few sprints and is super iterative and uh, it allows anyone on the team to really raise their hand and, and be able to influence the decisions. We've done, um, we've done casts and episodes before on things like agile development and things like design thinking. And it sounds like this is really just putting all that together into a very iterative, very customer centric kind of view of development. And a great example of this is, uh, is, is back in 2016, I was prototyping a brand new feature um, and we had a very clear problem statement. We wanted to offer a service that would be able to passively transfer money from people's checking account to their savings accounts. So um, big banks for, for a very long time have had this round up to the nearest dollar concept, but we wanted to blow that out. And uh, we took a prototype into that same research room that I was talking about. I coded up a, uh, uh, Mad Lib style uh, screen that was fully functional, um, but it was a little bit clunky and, and quite frankly, it was a little bit confusing for the user. Uh, I think at one point I calculated that there were 800,000 permutations of different ways that you could save money. You could save uh, $2 if you spend at, you know, if you spend on food and drink at a shell station until you pause or cancel the rule, something like that. Um, and so after seeing fresh eyes click around with this workable prototype, we were able to learn a ton. And the designers did a great job of creating a user experience before handing it off to the development team to, to release. And that small feature got taken out of research here in New York and passed to, a develop, to, to, to an expert team in Columbus to build out and now is being maintained by another team in San Francisco under the name of Chase Autosave which uh, I don't know if you've ever, if you've seen the Chase uh, t television commercials, I know I got a kick out of seeing the spot on the US Open, but at the end of the day, it's, it's turned out to be a really fantastic tool that's helped our customers save tens of millions of dollars. So that's a great example. Again, a very um, sort of experience led, customer driven kind of approach to that. Can you talk about some of the, the, the testing that you do to um, make sure that user experience is fine tuned? Kind of just expand on that a little bit more. Yeah, um, while focusing on having a great customer experience is definitely a priority, we're still a bank, right? And so the security of the platform is the highest priority. And so in terms of testing, um, we write a ton of unit tests around the code that, that we're committing. Um, we try to develop on different QA environments for each release and uh, we run regression automation scripts before each release. And so the way that we usually tackle it is we'll write unit tests around the business logic in the app and then we'll write automation tests around the interface. And obviously there's multiple security frameworks that are baked into our mobile apps. Um, but the last thing is that um, is, is we won't ship a feature into production without having an on-off switch. That way we can feel comfortable with everything that we're delivering is secure and we can manage the size of the user population if we need to. So, so you touched on two very important things in there that are uh, key to development, I think, going forward. One is test-driven development, right? Uh, and the other is feature flags, right? So just, let's just explore those a little bit, right? So test-driven development really you know, means making sure that you write the test cases before you write the code and you know how it's supposed to behave. Can you talk about the benefits that you find with that? I think that the, the biggest benefits is that you really understand the pitfalls before you start writing the code. Um, if you're thinking about testing before you build out the feature and before you put it on a phone, then you're identifying what the edge cases are. 
And oftentimes for an app our size with as many different customer segments and as many different services as we, as, as we launch, uh, we really need to think about all of the different use cases that our customers could be using. So um, for, for me, um, the, the planning upfront and the writing tests um, is, is absolutely vital for, for us to succeed. And the other thing that you mentioned in there is the on off switch, right? Which we refer to as feature flags, which enable you to sort of roll out this new feature for, you know, customer A, but not customer B and sort of figure out who gets what. Talk about the benefits of that as well. Yeah. So this has been around in, in the industry for, um, it's, it's been a really popular thing for about a decade. It's mm -hmm. A-B testing. Um, a lot of third party um, tools are out there. So if you're a smaller company, um, look into Mixpanel, look into some of the ones that are out there um, that, that are free or nearly free um, to do this because it's a really great way to, to um, launch a feature uh, under the guise of um, being secure, but also um, from our perspective, one of the most important things that we get out of it is that we bake our analytics into these feature flags so we know um, really which flow um, which which funnel is is succeeding? So um, we're we're able to make um, user experience decisions based on the feature flagging, and we're also able to lock down the app if we need to. Yeah, and and just to to build on that, um, I think you get a couple benefits that you mentioned. Number one is you know try a couple different ways and see which customers like better, right? And you can figure that out. The other one is you can also limit you know, the, the, the exposure, God forbid you make a mistake. You're not rolling it out to your entire customer base all at once. You can try a small group and if that works then you can expand further and further around that as well, right? Absolutely. Yeah, and both of those I think also, in, in, you know, increase your ability to deliver more meaningful features faster, right? Because, um, you know, you, you know how it's supposed to behave beforehand, which is why you do the test driven development. So you can automate a lot of your testing. You can automate a lot of your release management and other things like that as well, which really do speak to the agility of the, uh, of the team and the organization. So one of the other areas that gets a lot of attention and we spend a lot of time focusing on is making sure that our experiences and our apps are accessible to the greatest number of people. And one way that manifests itself is by ensuring that all of our experiences and applications are uh, compliant with the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you ensure that your app is accessible to everyone and ADA compliant? Yeah, so accessibility is extremely important to us at Chase, not just on the mobile app, but on the website as well. Mm -hmm. Our mobile accessibility features leverage the tools that exist on each of the platforms. Apple has a, a really strong suite of accessibility tools that we can leverage, but we usually try to take it a step further. So first we'll test for the voiceover experience to make sure that there's full feature parity between customers that can both see the screen and then customers who might be visually impaired. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a custom tool that we build ourselves to test for color contrast. So customers who might not be able to read the screen, read everything on the screen clearly still have the opportunity. And each of our teams will run their features by a subject matter expert who can talk us through any guidance or anything that needs to be enhanced. I remember one project I was working on, it was targeting millennials and we were building out a really unique experience that you were able to swipe and there was an image on the screen and you were able to swipe it up and down. And our designers wanted to push the envelope on this next gen feature to make it pop. And so every time that you would swipe this, this image, uh, the background color on the screen would start glowing, would, would, would blow up the screen um, in, in a really compelling way. And so we took that prototype into the research room that I was talking about earlier and watch customers as they were sitting there and they were swiping up and down. And there was a ton of excitement around this feature. Uh, but one of the unintended consequences was that the customer could keep flickering, um, could keep swiping up and down and, and the lighting, the background would cause a flickering sensation. Well, the feedback that we got on that feature from our accessibility partner was that it could cause someone to have an epileptic episode if they were prone to seizures. We obviously took that extremely seriously and yeah. took, a, took it offline to deep dive. Um, and what we uh, figured out was that our solution could be that um, as you started scrolling back and forth on this icon, uh, we were going to remove the user interaction after you changed the, the side twice and the icon would just animate back to the center. So that was a quick win. The customer still had the ability to access this feature and it looked great. 
Um, but we were no longer able to continually swipe. So it's all for the unintended consequence that we introduced during research. But, but that's a great example where, you know, you really wanted to push the envelope on this fantastic experience. Experience. In doing so, you had this unintended consequences, but it sounds like you got to a nice sort of, sort of, you know, common ground there where you could get enough of a new experience, uh, but still make it accessible to a broad audience. And that's the best part about taking a, a, a prototype into research and, and getting it into hands of real customers and, and, and seeing and, and really observing the insights of how they're using it. I want to come back to mobile experience versus sort of desktop experience, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times when you think about um, what makes a good mobile app, as, as you mentioned earlier, right? I think a lot of companies traditionally think they're just going to take their, their, their traditional desktop app and just put it on a phone or something else like that, right? Um, but if you look at when people first started adopting digital apps and and uh, or websites, let's say, and digitizing their processes, I think mean, they just took their regular sort of paper processes and brought them online. And how do people need to think differently about re-architecting or re-engineering their underlying business processes or how they interact with customers as they think about a mobile experience? Sure. Well, I think that a lot of customers are, are sort of going mobile or expecting a, a mobile counterpart for any web experience that exists. So um, definitely making sure that um, if there is a service that you're offering on a website that and that service is um, something that, that gets a lot of traffic, that there's the ability for customers to, to use that on a mobile phone. And the reason being that you want to be where your customers are. Um, if they're you know, uh, walking around the city or at a restaurant and they think about doing something, uh, they might forget about it by the time that they get home. So, so having a, a mobile feature um, built into the app, um, it allows them to just go ahead and check that off of their list. Um, and, and, and just generally speaking, um, mobile apps it, it seem to, in my opinion, seem to flatten a lot of the user experiences. So on websites, as you start clicking through, um, you have a lot more distractions and you have a lot more um, uh, clicks that, that you can take. Whereas um, in, in our case, the customers usually come to the banking app um, to do one specific thing. So, so we spend a lot of time trying to make the, the path as simple and streamlined as possible for the customers to be able to check that box, to be able to do that one specific thing. Yeah, I think that's, a, that's the key point there is basically you engineer for simplicity above all else, right? Um, you, you know, the way I phrase it is if you have to fit uh, something onto a five inch screen versus a, you know, a, a, a 12 inch or 16 inch desktop uh, uh, screen, you might have to rethink the way you think about, um, you know, capturing data. Right, you're not going to put a form out there with 50 fields. You're going to try to reuse as much as possible, or gather what you can from the, you know, you know, um, from uh, data you already have, or things like that. Right, and and also I'd say, you know, if you think about a mobile experience, like you said, you're at a restaurant or somewhere else like that, that's going to be a 10, 15, 20, 30 second experience, not a five minute experience. How do you sort of simplify? the engagement and for a lot of for a lot of companies you know it does mean rethinking about the way you do all of your business processes behind that it's not just about the front door right it's about what you do with that data on the back end too absolutely that brings up another point which is um you know at our firm and at most firms you have a lot of different teams that contribute to the development of these apps right you might have a mobile development team you might have a team working on the back end services you might have a team working on the you know, the web component, et cetera. How do you manage to keep, you know, the code clean, consistent, uh, integrated when you have so many different people sort of working on the same code base and make sure code quality is up and things like that? Code hygiene is really important to us. And, and part of it is that we hire really great people to work here. Everyone that I work with is an expert in their craft. And that goes for the colleagues on my team writing the mobile code and either Swift or Java and Kotlin, but, but also the backend developers and our automation experts, the list goes on. And, uh, but part of it is defining standards and sticking to them. We have a pretty well-defined approval policy where, where multiple people will have to sign off on every line of code that's committed into the app. We also have governance boards to set best practices, um, and, and we have a really great support system if you have questions. There's even an internal stack overflow if, if you're really stuck on something. But at the, at the end of the day, we're all working on a product that impacts tens of millions of people as part of their daily routine, and the scale is so enormous that it really locks you in, especially around release time.
and there's no room for error. So we all kind of understand that and take pride in what we do. Now, how do you make sure though, with all of those processes and controls around that, that you're still able to be sort of nimble, move quickly, and it doesn't sort of grind you down to a halt? Yeah, well, I mean, we have, we have an advantage uh, in the sense that we have scrum teams all across the world. And so we have um, people that can be part of the review process, can be part of answering questions at, at any point of the day. Um, but it also goes back to our point earlier and, and having really clearly defined requirements up, up front and organizing um, all the um, all of the checkpoints that, that you would have to do at the beginning of the process doing the test driven development um, that that helps all of the developers because they know exactly what they're trying to do this sprint um, we, we have a we have a clear direction of where we want to go um, and so doing the prep work up front really helps us in the back end yeah so two things in there that i think are worth um worth uh worth we're digging into a little bit uh, number one is making sure that everybody involved in the development of the um, of the application, sort of understands how what they do aligns to sort of the greater purpose, right? What is it we're trying to help clients do, and understand the client journey and other things like that, so they can realize how their part fits into it, right? Um, and then the other one that that may be counterintuitive to people is often you have to be a little bit more prescriptive in terms of how things get done to be innovative, right? You might think that, no, sort of you let people go and fly and be free, but, but, but the more complex the environment, the more you have, the, the greater the, the nightmare, the integration becomes that may cause you know, more problems, right? Absolutely. So Rob, obviously 2020 has been a, um, a different year, I think in so many different ways. And I don't think any of us could have envisioned uh, what the pandemic uh, you know, had in store for us and the things like that. How has the pandemic changed the way you think about development? Honestly, uh, our team has dealt with crises in the past, both big and small. Uh, some are just fire drills, some geopolitical or otherwise. Obviously this was a big one, but I think that everyone was able to keep their focus. It's a really interesting question. A few episodes ago, I think sometime last month, you interviewed George Sherman, the head of our global technology infrastructure team. And you guys had a really fantastic talk about the resiliency plans at the firm and how you guys had been investing for a decade to try to get these right. And one of the things that he mentioned was that if your job, your role at the firm is going to be asking you to do something outside of the physical office, then we're just going to go ahead and give you a laptop right away as your daily driver. And so my team does maintenance and really schedules at night and over the weekend. So we fell into that bucket. And so in terms of productivity, we were okay. The firm has a huge investment in cloud computing. So we were good there. We use Git for our source control and Git is Git. You can, there's no issues committing code as long as you have internet. So at the beginning of the pandemic, we started game planning. What could be major blockers in 2020 that would totally shut down the whole development team if we didn't get ahead of it. And so we knew from experience that an Apple in the fall was going to introduce a new iOS. Mm -hmm. And so in order for us to be able to test and certify our builds that, that they would work on iOS 14, we'd have to download Xcode 12. And so also from experience, we knew that that meant that on our corporate Macs, we would have to upgrade the operating system to Catalina. And so you can imagine that uh, doing that install in a hundred and hundreds of corporate Macs that literally spanned the globe with varying internet speeds on slowed down by VPN with no access to ethernet. It was a logistical challenge, um, but we were ultimately successful and able to run all of our code and, and certify that the builds were working on iOS 14 without any issues. So I think it's really about um, how being able to deal with the unexpected when it comes up, right? And I think a lot of that becomes a lot easier if you do sort of assume that um, you have kind of a mobile way of working, right? Uh, not specifically around mobile apps, but just generally people could be able to work from everywhere, uh, from anywhere, excuse me. Um, and uh, then that enables you, if you don't have to worry about that, then you have time to focus on things like an emergency upgrade to Catalina or things like that as well, right? <laughs> No, I think you're absolutely right. And, and the other thing is that the feature priorities changed overnight. Mm -hmm. And so business requirements came down to the development teams that weren't otherwise on our roadmap. So understanding how to iterate fast and go from mock-ups to production was really crucial here. Some examples of this included beefing up our secure message center or a virtual assistant 
or being able to access new banking features that didn't exist, like the PPE applications or old ones, like uh, being able to change travel plans in the ultimate rewards portal. As you can imagine, there are a lot of travel plans being changed. Um, and so um, being agile and introducing these new features at incredible speed, we were able to decrease the amount of calls that were needed to be routed through our call center, which trickles down into real customer benefits, you know, shorter wait times, less anxiety, and just generally more control. Yeah, I think that's a great point, and, and one that may not um, you know, be intuitive to a lot of people, which is independent of how the pandemic has caused you to think about development itself, um, I think the pandemic has caused a lot of companies to realize how much more critical than maybe they had ever thought the digital and mobile channels are for them, right? Because you have fewer people going to stores or branches or other things like that. They're doing a lot more uh, from home on these channels and things like that is more, and the expectations are higher, right? And you want to drive more traffic to those channels and you have to be able to react quickly to, to, to new requirements. Right, I, I kind of look at it, the, the work that our teams did at the beginning of the pandemic was a temporary sprint that will certainly pay out in the long run, but putting my, engineering bias aside, when it comes to personal finances, people love to speak to real human beings. And I'm deeply appreciative of the men and women that work at our physical bank branches. And after seeing behind the curtains, they have a lot that they're capable of handling for our customers. So I'm certainly more appreciative now than I was before the pandemic That's great. Started. That's a great point. That's a great point. Uh, finally, Rob, what advice would you have for either startups or smaller companies that might have not have the scale and resources of a JP Morgan Chase or a large firm that have, how can they take advantage of some of these same components and processes and doing mobile development? If you or your team aren't using your product, then you're already behind. That's the most important advice that I can give. You have to eat your own dog food, so to speak. So now if you're, if you're pre-launch, then my advice would be to release a beta tomorrow. There's no time to hesitate. Just figure out how people are, are interacting with your technology. Um, and if you've already launched, then the next piece of advice would be to add analytics to really understand what people are using, what features people are using, and what makes them come back into the app. There are a ton of fantastic third-party analytics frameworks out there that are free or nearly free. You have Google Analytics, Mixpanel, Firebase, Flurry. I wouldn't overthink it. Just add as many touch points as you can. Uh, build out your most important funnel. What is the core competency of your app? And uh, are your users dropping off at any point? Do you have a sticky feature? Do you have a feature where people are telling their friends uh, to download your app? And if so, invest in that. Grease those wheels. And so, you know, I, I feel like there's no substitute for getting real-time customer feedback. The last thing is, and, and probably the most important, is to make sure that your company culture is one that reflects how you want to be perceived in the market. You should treat your employees well and give them flexibility, empower them to make great decisions, and let them help carry the load. And again, if you're not using your own product, then you're already behind. Great. So just to recap, number one, over-index on client feedback, right? Get something out there quickly, uh, get a lot of feedback, see what people like, see what they don't, et cetera. You know, number two is uh, invest in analytics and make sure you're using that to, uh, to understand uh, how people are using the app, uh, what's working, what's not, where you're losing people, et cetera. And you know, tooling and analytics doesn't have to be expensive, right? There's a lot of uh, you know, publicly available open source tools out there you can use, right? And, and as you said, you know, make sure you're using it and experiencing it, what your, what your clients uh, do as well, right? Eat your own dog food, as you said. You got it. So Rob, thanks very much for joining us today and thanks for your insights. Thanks a lot. And to all of our listeners, um, thanks for joining us today. Remember, if you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe and rate us at uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Tune in next time.